Bell Baptist Church. It's good to see everyone this Sunday morning. Let's all grab our hymn books. We'll stand together. 391. The hymn books are going to be in the seats uh, underneath, uh, in front of you, perhaps next to you in some rows. 391. We'll sing A Flag to Follow. 391. to be in the scripture and to learn from your word things that we can practically live out in our lives. And I pray that you would bless each Sunday school teacher this morning with the supernatural ability to be able to impart truth. And God, I pray that for each of us that we would just have hearts and minds to hear and listen and that you would help us to be able to absorb the truth and use it. God, in our lives even this week, we just thank you for what you're going to do now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're going to seat the adults. We're going to hold the kids. Dismiss Mrs. Price. So, wait, 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 wait. You're not Mrs. Price. I know you're not Mrs. Price. Because I married her and you're not her. Uh. <laughs> Mrs. Price, get out of here. Yeah. Mrs. Price, I'll please leave. Later. Oh. <laughs> Mrs. Price, we need you to go. <laughs> Oh, that was terrible, wasn't it? All right, we're going to dismiss the kids with Mrs. Price. Oh, I thought that was never going to happen. And teens outside. Everybody else, you can be seated. Nursery kids can head on back with, uh, with Mrs. Riffle. And for everybody else, um, who does not have a copy of the handout? Well, um, oh, um, thank you for. I don't. Um, yeah, well, they're they're on the back the table. Back. There we are. Uh, there should be two handouts. Only you got a copy. I take it, huh? There should be two. There's two pages. Let me. Uh, I'll come on back and hit those, and we'll uh, get started. Two and page two. 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 
How's the volume? Volume good? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Amen. We'll be in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Continuing our New Life Discipleship series. Um, over the past three weeks, we've discussed such topics as assurance of salvation. There's handouts on the back table. Take one of each and have a seat. Thank you for coming. And we'll be in 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'm going to put this mic down just a bit. Okay. That's a little better. Then two weeks ago, we spent two weeks on learning about the holiness of God and how it affects our li and how it ought to affect our lives. Uh, previous handouts are available. You can see me personally. I'll make sure you get a copy of those. And they're also available. These are... Um, and then this week and next week, we'll be looking into the topic of being an example. Uh, these are fill-in-the-blank handouts. They're a, great, they're a great reminder for those of us who have been saved for a long time. But perhaps some of us, there's some people who may not have been saved for a long time and are just starting to learn the basics. And these are a great, these, this series has been a great way to um, really get somebody new in the faith grounded in what we believe in, in how... The Bible works and how how to learn how to learn scripture and how to grow in your life. And so we're going to be in First Timothy chapter four. We'll be turning to many different scriptures throughout the um, throughout this morning. We're going to be getting all the way up through Roman numeral four. So we'll be going through Roman numerals one, two, and three. Roman numeral three carries over onto page two. Let's pray and we'll begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to look into your word this morning. God, I would just ask that you would guide all of us to see the importance of being an example of your saving grace, of your saving faith. Help us to be more like your son. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'd like to start reading from verse 11. For context, these things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Paul continues on to, uh, telling Timothy what things to to be an example of to, to those that were following him as Timothy and Paul were following Christ. Now, we have heard all, we've mostly heard statements like, oh, you know, first impressions count the most. Or perhaps, oh, well, this, this guy's really good, but uh, his actions speak louder than his words. Um, you can judge someone by the friends they keep. That's certainly true. Or lastly, his reputation has gone before him. What can people say about us? Our memory verse tells us to be an example of the believers, to the believers, and then to give us, and it gives us some areas in which people should be able to see that we're Christians, that we belong to God, we're no longer belonging to ourselves, we're no longer of ourselves, and that we are his, we've been bought, and that we want to conduct ourselves in a manner that is belonging of such. And let's take a look at each of these areas. Our six Roman numerals between this week and next week cover each of the six phrases that Paul covered to Timothy. In word, being an example of a believer, in word, in conversation, in charity, those are the three we'll cover today, in spirit, in faith, in purity, Lord willing, we'll be covering those next week, next Sunday. All right, for, uh, point Roman numeral one, or I, in word, that would be our speech. Uh, turn with me over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 4.
But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, with try, which trieth our hearts. The blanks you'll be filling in under letter A. Start with the word speak. Then you'll have a semicolon. Not as pleasing men, comma, but God. There's handouts on the uh, back table. Good morning. Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Men can try you all they want, but in the end, you don't always account to men. But you will stand before God one day. Make, make, make sure it's important that if you are judged before men, that you're found faithful to God. But more importantly, when you're tried before God at the, at the, at the, uh, at the Bema seat, that's when everything will count. And God tries our hearts. God knows our hearts. Uh, letter B. Uh, turn to James chapter 1. Verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. I'd like to uh, continue on reading verses 20 through 27. They go along with the context. This is perhaps something you can look, th look through a little deeper in, um, on separate time. Verse 20. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity, that would be abundance, of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of, manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Note verses 26 and 27 in particular. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Very important verses to remember there, verses 26 and 27 of James chapter 1. And that is the importance of being able... We can only do it through the Holy Spirit and through the power of God to keep our own tongue and our own ways and, and ourselves in check. We can't do that in our own strength. We're going to falter and fail and flounder every time. But if we say one thing and do another that renders what we're trying to do as something that's not as meaningful and perhaps even vain. It says vain here. The bridle is not his own tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. The point is, we're, we're trying to keep, we need to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. The world's out there trying to look for the smallest little fleck in your life and in mine that's going to give them an excuse to not come to saving faith. They only need to find one, and it almost, almost seems like no matter what you'll do afterward, 
you'll never win that person. Maybe somebody else will, but the likelihood of that goes way down. It only takes, it only takes a second of being in sin to lose someone for eternity. Turn over, uh, so the, the three blanks that you're filling out back to uh, verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be, first blank you're filling out, swift to hear. Second blank, slow to speak. Third blank, slow to wrath. Swift to hear. Slow to speak, slow to wrath. I think a wise mother once said, you've got two ears and one mouth, therefore you should listen twice as much as you talk. And I think that's a wisdom I think a lot of us would like to employ more often than not. Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to start reading in verse 33, but the blank you'll be filling out is going to be in verse number 37. Again, ye have heard that has been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Your blanks that you're filling out there is after the word whatsoever in, the verse, in verse 37 is more than these cometh of evil. Give you 30 seconds to uh, fill that out, and then if you look my way, we'll uh, move on to uh, letter D. Give everybody another few seconds just to fill those out. All right, more hands, more heads are up than not. Let's move on to letter D. Your speech can deny the faith you claim. When Peter wanted to be sure the people thought he was not with Jesus, Matthew chapter 26. Remember that all, at one time all the disciples, including Peter himself, said, I will not deny you, Lord. Yet, yet Jesus prophesied, said, that Peter would deny him, not once, not twice, but three times. Uh, for context, let's look at, I'm in the wrong chapter. Let's look at verse 69 for context. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. I'm just making a note here for later context. Verse 70. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. That's denial number one. Verse 71. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he, this being Peter, denied with an oath, I do not know the man. Number two. 73. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art also one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. Three. And immediately the cock crew. Now, we're all indeed very grateful that verse 75 happened. I'd like to read it. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny, deny me thrice, meaning three times. And he went out 
and wept bitterly. The reference is in Matthew chapter 26, verse 34. That's where all the disciples, 34 and 35, that's where all the disciples and Peter said that they were not going to deny the Lord. Yeah, look what happened. When Peter wanted to be sure the people thought he was not with Jesus, he began to curse and swear, saying, those are your blanks that you're filling out under letter D and number, number one. It's on the left-hand side of page one of your handout. Furthermore, point number two, Christ tells us not to deny him. Turn over to Luke chapter 12. Number eight for context. Also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the, shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. Your blanks that you're filling in in this order are, the first blank is going to be denieth, D-E-N-I-E-T-H. The second, second blank is before. third blank will be denied fourth blank before then the fifth seventh sixth and seventh blanks are angels of God give everybody 30 seconds to fill those out and then we'll continue does tell others your beliefs. Your speech speaks for you. That's why it's very important to be a person, be a person of few words. The less, think about it, the less we, you and I speak, the less opportunity we're going to have to say something we're going to regret. And also, that when we are speaking, give Give yourself a second to pro. Give yourself some time to process what somebody else has said to you. The sooner you actually try, the sooner you respond to something, chances are more than likely you're gonna re you're not gonna respond the right way. And that could be in a general sense, or that could be even in a in a in a in a, in a situation that has a potential to escalate. And that's what we're. We're not to be. So, our speech. Be an example of the believer, first in word. Second, in conversation. Now, this is an old English word that means actions or way of life. Turn with me over to Acts chapter 4. And once you're in Acts 4, we'll read verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, remember, these are two guys, more importantly Peter, more so Peter than John, that had earlier run away or outright denied the Lord Jesus. But Peter had gotten forgiveness, and on that great day of Pentecost, but through the Holy Spirit, preached that great sermon that saw 3,000 people come to Christ. Now him and John are doing great works by the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 13, Now when they, that would be the Sanhedrin, saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them, that they had been with Jesus. So the blanks you're going to be filling out in the verse. The first blank is boldness. 
This is under letter A under Roman numeral two. Second blank is unlearned. Third blank is ignorant. Fourth blank is marveled, M-A-R-V-E-L-L-E-D. Then the final blanks are they took knowledge. You know, that's one of the most interesting things about that passage is that this, this, this group of highly religious leaders took knowledge, took a fact of Peter and John that they had been with Jesus. Perhaps one of the highest commendations that could ever be said about a person who, walked this, who, walks, this, who walks this great planet. How about the commendation could be said of us? Yep. Have we been with Jesus? Okay. Letter B. What did Joseph's behavior show according to Genesis 39, verse 3? So we're going to turn all the way back. I don't believe we get to it this week, no. But next week, we'll learn a little bit more about Joseph. We'll be learning a little bit more about Joseph in next week's lesson, Lord willing. But I want to note Genesis 39, verse 3. Verse 1 for context. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, he's an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. The Ishmaelites were the, uh, the group that uh, Joseph was uh, sold to by his brothers in chapter 37. Note verse 2. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Verse 4. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. And he, that is Potiphar, made Joseph overseer over his house. And all that he had, he put into his hand. Potiphar saw that God was with Joseph. And therefore entrusted Joseph with everything he had. Now this um, Potiphar is, he is an Egyptian He's, a fair, he's an officer of Pharaoh. You have to take it, this man's probably pretty wealthy. He's probably got a huge land, lots of, lots of possessions. And he saw that the Lord was with Joseph. And he made everything. And that since he saw that the Lord was with Joseph, and that the Lord was blessing Joseph, he took note of it and proceeded to put his trust in Joseph. And all that he had into the hands of Joseph. That the, so his master saw that, the blanks you're filling in are just basically the rest of the verse. That the Lord was with him. And that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. I'll give everybody 30 seconds to fill that out. And if you're done filling that out, you can turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 18. So not only did Joseph's conversation show... Potiphar, that the Lord was with him. But furthermore, David's wise behavior had earned him these same blessings. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse number 5. And David 
went out whithersoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So the, the blanks you're filling out are the majority of the verse. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people. And then the rest of the verse is filled out for you already, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Here we see two men, Joseph and David, who have sought before God to please him with their lives, and by their conversation, God, God, God uh, blessed their lives, and that in turn, these other men, Saul and Potiphar in this instance, noted that, and therefore entrusted David and Joseph with these various things that they might have otherwise ne never gotten by just simply their faith in God. Point number three. We looked at and being an example of the believer in word, in conversation, and now thirdly and lastly this morning, in charity, that would be godly love. This love says here under the in the we're in the right hand side of page two of your of page one sorry of your handout. This love is an unselfish love. Charity causes us to think and speak well of others. Godly love judges others kindly and desires to make them happy. Letter A. The godly love, charity, is spoken of throughout the Bible. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. An entire chapter speaking of the char of charity. This would be the charity that means godly love, not uh, not holy char the charity that sometimes we may think of today. Chapter 13. We're going to focus on verses 4 through 8. I'd like to read a couple of extra verses, though. Verse 1, I'm starting it. The Bible says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. We can do whatever we may seek to do, but if we have not godly love one to another, one to people that are lost, it will rub off as being nothing. Verse four in, verse 4 in context, and we're going to flip over to page 2 of your handout. Within these verses, there are many descriptions of God's meaning of charity. Verse, um, verse 4 to start. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things. Endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fall. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether they, 
whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Verses four. So again, let's go back to verse 4, and we'll start filling in the blanks. Uh, number 1, charity suffereth long and is kind. These are found in verse number 4. What I found to help me with these last night is that if you put next to the number... The, the number one or number two or number three and so on and so forth. If you put the verse number maybe in parentheses next to it, I found that to be a big help. So this was found in verse four. Next couple actually are going to be found in verse four. So, not, so number one, charity suffereth long and is kind. Number two, charity envieth not. Number three, that's also from verse four. Number three, also in verse four, charity vaunteth not itself. So it does not brag. It does not brag of itself. It is humble. It is not puffed up. Not arrogant. That's also found in verse four. Number four, this is found in verse five. Charity does not behave itself unseemly me or rudely seeketh not her own is not easily provoked p r o v o k e d thinketh no evil does not keep accounts of evil, but rather of love. Number five, this is found in verse six. Charity rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoiceth, R-E-J, O I C E T H in truth. Number six. Chair, this is found in verse seven. Charity beareth all things, believeth. All things hopeth all things endureth all things. So it bears all things, it can handle whatever is thrown at it. It believeth all things, no matter how hard it may seem to want to do. It hopeth all things. It, ta it takes into account faith. Endures all <coughs> things, no matter what may come in, the, in, a, in, their, in your life. If you have charity and you seek to have charity, it will be able to endure even the greatest of temptations. It will be able to endure the deepest of trials. Finally, in verse 8, number 7, charity never faileth. The note that says, verse 13, and now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Charity is even greater in the sight of God than faith and hope. Finally, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> I'd like to start reading in verse number 9. Let love be without dissimulation or hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. 
teaches us how we should behave in general and also how that we should love other Christians. It says that we must love without dissimulation. I'll spell that out for you. D-I-S-S-I-M-U-L-A-T-I-O-N. In parentheses, it says, in truth, not putting on an act, not showing hypocrisy, not being a hypocrite, that sort of thing. It says to abhor, or hate, that which is evil, and cleave to, parentheses, hold on to, and parentheses, that which is good. So your blanks that you're filling out, the first blank is dissimulation, second blank is evil, the third blank is which is good. Furthermore, verse 10, we are to be kindly affectionate. A-F-F-E-C-T-I-O-N-A-T-E. -E. Kindly affectionate. One to another. With brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Another. Showing brotherly love is preferring your fellow Christian over you. Sometimes it may even mean taking the low road, taking the low road, taking the, taking the low road, being saying, you know what, this isn't the, you know, maybe, maybe there's some. I don't want dissimulation between us, you know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prefer you in this instance. We're going to... We live righteously only by his power. We can and we must love one another. If we, we can't even show love to our fellow Christians. How is anybody in the world going to want this? In true charity, if we are going to please God and have his full blessing on our lives. Finally, true charity is of God and for God and through God. And remember what Paul says in Philippians 4.13 when he says that I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So this morning we learned that we are to be an example of the believers in six different aspects. We covered three of them this morning. We covered how to be an example in word. That would mean our speech, our everyday speech. In conversation, that would be in our way of life. And thirdly, in charity, meaning godly love. We have three more ways to be an example, and we'll be seeing those in our lesson next week, Lord willing. Does anybody have any questions this morning? Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this opportunity you've given us to learn how to be an example this morning. Perhaps, Lord, maybe one or two of us are convicted that we haven't been the best examples. Lord, we confess these faults to you. And we ask for your we ask for your forgiveness and we ask for your grace. Lord, help us to be this, this godly example. We thank you for the great example you set before us in Jesus Christ. Lord, as we go to our Sunday morning service this morning, I just pray you would help all of us to learn from your word again. Be willing to have open our hearts to, your, to the truth. That we may glean something from it and apply it to our lives. We'll thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed until that time. Service will begin in about 15 minutes.